Welcome, everybody. This is the Coffee with a Geek program. It is November of 2021. It's just uh, on our way out of November. Can't wait to talk to my next guest. I came across him through our latest NiceGate conference here in New York State, which is our New York uh, computer and ed tech conference. And Al was a uh, featured speaker for the event. So I'm going to talk to him about that for just a moment. But so welcome, Al. Great to have you join me. Thank you. Lovely to be here. And uh, usually I ask, uh, what's your favorite cup of coffee? Have a favorite blend? My guilty pleasure is I'm a, I'm a Starbucks guy, a, a caramel macchiato. So does that count as a favorite blend? Sure it does. Sure it does. We're, we're pretty open to all brands of coffee. If it's got any sort of coffee flavoring, I think we're good. <laughs> okay. Brilliant. All right. So uh, let's dig right in because I'm so fascinated. I've been kind of doing some research from your uh, website specifically, but I'm going to start with kind of the second question I sent you first and tell me about you and tell me about kind of your background and your educational journey because you have a pretty uh, unique background. So let's start with that. Yeah, so I'll try and keep it fairly condensed. Um, I kind of have two different pathways. So one part of my career is spending the last 30 years leading an ed tech company. So developing all kinds of technology to support schools, whether it's keeping the IT working, which is always a key to keeping children safe online and also the classroom orchestration and instructional technology. So all different facets of the school. And then in parallel, um, I've always been, you know, very proactive in terms of education and the value that that has for lifelong learners, not just for children. So I started off with school governance many years ago, supporting schools um, and their leadership aspirations, providing that, as we refer to it, the critical friend, the challenge and support for our school leaders. Became chair of an academy and then a multi-academy trust. So think of it like a small school district. And then a number of multi-academy trusts chairing and helping support them in their growth and um, their journeys. And along the way, um, was appointed to the Regional Schools Commissioners Board, which is the body that supports the schools and districts across the United Kingdom. Uh, and then alongside that, I was appointed as independent chair for our SEND board, the board that supports the ambitions for our special education needs and disability children, make sure that we're getting the absolute most we can in terms of support on their learning journeys. And then as children get older, I am an apprenticeship ambassador, so working as that kind of conduit to provide opportunities for young people leaving school for different pathways into the workplace. And of course, looking ahead now, how we've got that disconnect between the skills we need in the workplace and the skills that our young people are acquiring on their way. So sort of 30 years doing the ed tech side and doing the supporting and helping schools grow across the UK. You know, as you were kind of relaying your educational journey, I, I couldn't help but think you have such a vast array of experiences that I know must have been so valuable for your work, uh, especially with education. How does somebody who doesn't have that, that vast background for leadership today, how do they get up to speed on, on all of this? I think, I think rec we recognize that um, I often refer to there's a real distinction between the commercial world and education, and that is within education, that willingness to share. Uh, and we sort of take it for granted a little bit, but in most sectors, you know, if you've got something that gives you a competitive advantage or you do well, you tend to keep it to yourself. In the education space, I think we're much more receptive to sharing. Some new technology, not that new now, social media and other platforms provide a great way to help network and share best practice. But actually the biggest challenge, I think, in terms of learning, adapting skills and best practice is really that usual chestnut of um, not enough time. And it's actually recognizing that professional development is not something that we shape or we should shape into uh, the start of the academic year, but needs to be something that's factored into all of our planning. And when I wear my ed tech hat, thinking about the role of technology, you know, we've learned so much over the last couple of years that the same applies. You can have all the shiny kit in the world, you can have all the great solutions, but if people don't have confidence in using them, and strategically being able to understand how to measure impact, how you align that technology with your own strategic ambitions for your school and how it impacts on teaching and learning, then ultimately it's doomed to failure. And often we look back over the last 20, 30 years, and many of the biggest technology projects that hit the news that perhaps weren't as successful as intended, when you actually unpick them, the barrier to success wasn't necessarily always the technology but actually nobody had a real clear plan about how we were going to bring everyone along on the journey 
or how we were going to actually measure the success of that project. Yeah, I think the measuring may is an important piece and often gets left <laughs> left left aside. I think, um, or, or would you agree or disagree with that? Well, I think often there's there's a there's a there's a simple measure or an aspiration for what we want to do, and I certainly hope in most cases we have not just the want but the why as that key discussion piece. But I think we have to recognise that when we think of education, and you know, forgive me for narrowing down on the technology point we tend to apply too narrow a focus. So we think our measures for most things that happen in a school are about student outcomes. And that's not a bad measure, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. But actually some things are, are more about, you know, there may be one or two step removed. So often when we look at the role of technology or the way that we operate in a school, it's about freeing up time or resource or, or funding finance that actually two steps removed ultimately results in more equipment, more technology, or more time for the teacher for the teaching and learning. So if we always have a mindset of measuring things in terms of that pure, did student grades increase, we're often kind of missing that bigger picture of, um, you know, let's take the last couple of years, you know, what about well-being? How about retention of staff within a school? If we have a project that results in staff having better balance of well-being and they stick around in education, isn't that a huge measure of impact? But do we consider that a real, realistic or an effective measure? Often we don't because we look at the tangibles on how a school is normally judged. And so we kind of need to kind of take a step back and think, actually, not all things are an immediate measure. They're, they're the sums of many parts. So recently you did your uh, keynote virtually to NiceGate. Can you tell me a little bit about your presentation? What were your kind of key um I guess, what were the takeaways for that you wanted for? Uh... Well, I was talking about digital strategy in the broadest sense. So if we kind of unpick that term, which gets used quite regularly for lots of different things, whether it's digital strategy or digital vision, it was really about with the acceleration and adoption of technology, how do we actually decide what our plan is? What do we want to achieve? Why do we want to achieve it? How are we going to measure it? How are we going to move the project forward? And how are we going to take the most effective ways to make sure that we can focus on those different measurables within a school or district? So I talked about the lessons learned, the fact that sometimes you have to look backwards in order to move forwards, to be that reflective on how technology has worked already. And when we think about technology adoption, the normal mindset is what we're going to go out and purchase. Well, actually, the first step is what we've we got already and how well is it being used? Uh, because often the savings are you know, subscriptions that we don't need to renew each year because actually they're not being used or technology that could be better deployed somewhere else and used throughout the school day more effectively. And then it's about, well, how do we shape a plan? And of course, it seems really obvious, but it's a bit of a Venn diagram. You know, at the heart is teaching and learning, staff and students. But around that, you've got many stakeholders, whether we're considering data privacy, the quality of access, our overall school strategic plans, uh, how we're keeping our children safe, our online safety, um, and of course, fiscal measures, as well as the IT team, the infrastructure, making sure that they're part of that narrative and discussion so that we're not building on, on you know, sandy land, for want of a better term. And then once we've got that, it comes into the, the sense of, well, what are the main things that actually shape success and failure when you introduce change? Uh, and we've learned over the last 18 months that one of the key barriers or the key facilitators, if you're successful, has been about how you develop staff confidence alongside student confidence, how to get the most out of the technology. If you uh, make a decision at the top of the tree in your district and on the first day of the school year, a cart of new Chromebooks arrive in there with some new technology on and no one's really aware of what we're trying to achieve, why we've changed, what we're going to do. The odds are if we don't have confidence as we lift the lids, they're going to work in the way that we expect them to be. Um, increasingly over time, they'll be used less and less in the lesson and we'll end up in a situation where the technology won't have impact or become embedded. Similarly, if we introduce solutions without providing the right infrastructure and getting the IT team on board and, and them being aware and part of that purchasing process, we won't have the capacity to support the effective use. So again, over time, we'll find that it's less and less effective. And then we kind of look beyond that and say, okay, so we, we've got those processes. How do we select the right technology? And that's now when we move to this two strands. There's the, the technology side of, is it device agnostic? Will it fit into our current infrastructure? Does it have the flexibility to suit new technology that we might acquire in the future, the building blocks? And then there's also the pillars. So one might be students' technology, technical skills alongside their um, digital citizenship skills. One might be about teachers' technical skills. One might be about the infrastructure. 
one often is about enhancing and improving communication, whether that's in school between staff, school to parents, school to the broader community. There'll be well-being sitting in there about how can some of these tools actually make a positive impact on both staff and student well-being, whether it's for our more vulnerable learners, maintaining that consistency of communication, or for staff just breaking out the silos and providing back channels where they can share best practice and resources. And once you identify what the key pillars are that are relevant to your school or district, you can start to appoint the flag bearers. Who are the people that can drive this forward? Who are the ones that have most confidence in the current tools, the go-to people, rather than leaving everybody with a kind of, you've had your two or three hours worth of training at the start of the year. Now figure it out. Find the time in your own time to get on, online and learn more about it. And, and again, these are all things that when you start to break them down, I hope for most people make sense, but it's about shaping that, that strategy. And the most important thing is money, the finance team shouldn't shouldn't select the journey. They might shape the speed of the journey, but the actual journey itself should be shaped by bringing all those stakeholders together as part of that vision and recognizing that every year it'll change. You'll adapt it depending on what more information you know. And then the final, final part, which is often the most important one, is if we're going to measure and we're going to move forward in any organization with change, you need to have the measurements of impact. How are you going to measure its benefit? And then if you know that and you can identify realistic measures of impact, don't try and do 20 things all at once. It's much better to do a few things well, measure the impact, build confidence, build the evidence it was successful, and then everyone's in a much more positive position to do more of that or to invest more in something. And so sometimes schools have taken a perception that you know those with the most tech are the most successful in their adoption journey which is not true. Sometimes technology has no relevant place in the classroom. Sometimes it absolutely does. So the measure is not who's got the most, it's how well it's used and how can we evidence that. It's, it's a lot to unpack. I, I guess, again, I'm, I'm in the state, so I see a variety of different schools and ways they're doing it. Do you find from your uh, standpoint, uh, schools doing it well? kind of balancing all of those those pillars? Um, there's different measures of well. I mean, I think the first thing to always recognise, and hopefully it reassures people, those two schools are the same, often based on not just the, the starter position of their technology, but also in terms of the technical competence of their, their workforce, the teachers, and also the cohorts of students. So there'll be different pathways for younger learners versus older learners, those with um, kind of hit, I suppose, that was was on my radar was the Middle East. Uh, and there are many international schools there. Um, and being international schools, they're well-funded and they had good technology bases. And they very rapidly flipped from a typical classroom model to an almost entirely online virtual model. But it was all synchronous, pretty much replicate the school day, but doing it through um, Teams or, or Zoom or Meet or whatever. And actually, very quickly, they realized that, that that linear swap just didn't quite fit. Not only did it not apply to all teachers' confidence in using the tools, but also different learners engaged in different ways. And then suddenly we had that kind of blended conversation about actually you need a bit of mixture between that synchronous and asynchronous. And in the same way, we've seen schools where it, it is absolutely a, a journey where the pace will be shaped by what the school's got, where their confidence levels are, and what their particular needs are in terms of their areas for development. If a school has a really broad and, and enriched curriculum already, then their journey to looking at whether they want to introduce AR and VR and other things might be very different to another school that hasn't as yet introduced, you know, tablets to children within a certain setting. So that mixture, I think, is really the key point. So you kind of answered some of my questions about what are your thoughts on the future of education? I think you kind of planted that seed already. And what are some of the lessons you've learned uh, during the year of pandemic? Is there any other loose ends you'd like to to throw in there about those two questions? I think the most important one is to, to consider the ecosystem as a whole. So I've heard lots rightly of support for teachers and educators in how they've adapted and utilized new technology, and, and rightly so, because I think many other sectors could learn the lessons. But if we actually unpick it, the successful adoption and use of technology and how schools have managed the last 18 months has been not just the teaching staff, but the IT teams that have had to factor and flip and shape that as well as the, the teaching assistants back to support our more vulnerable learners. So it's highlighted the fact that actually to be successful, when you're looking at new technology adoption, you've got to consider the 
the voices and the training for all, not just one segment of your workforce. And the schools that identified that all stakeholders need to be part of the conversation and part of the training were the ones that were quickest to get it embedded and confidence levels built. So this will be a great time to kind of dovetail into your book, My Secrets, Ed Tech Diary, hashtag Ed Tech. Uh, tell me about the book. Well, um, it's not much of a secret now, but um, <laughs> at the time it sounded like a good idea. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, Ed Tech is a passion, 30 years of doing it. Um, I, I think there's a, there's a, it was a key point for me as we moved through the first year and a bit of the pandemic, which was I wanted to reflect on the role of Ed Tech over the last 30 or 40 years. But the biggest problem I, and barrier I had is when we sit down and, and mention the word ed tech, um, half the educators in the room go, oh, this will be interesting. I've got a view on this. Let's get involved. And the other half kind of go, oh, no, 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 that's, that's the realm of the techies and the geeks. That's not for me. When actually it shouldn't be. It should be accessible to everybody. So I chose to write something that I hope was accessible to everybody, plain English and where technical terms are used, a bit of a glossary and an our explanation of what those terms meant. And what I wanted to share was, if we look back, we can learn some lessons, certainly over a longer term, about the barriers to successful adoption and how that technology worked. And then if we think about the broader sense, um, when it comes to the last 18 months, we flipped for the first time from a position of theoretical benefit of how technology may or may not impact to one of evidence base. We've, we've learned lots of lessons. It's been that amplifier, that accelerator for us in terms of getting technology and ed tech up the top of the list. And up until recently, it's always been a topic that schools have wanted to talk about, but never been a priority. And then suddenly, with, I'm very fortunate in my role um, that I work all around the world with different schools, districts, international schools. I wanted to collect the voices, align the voices from educators around the world of how they've adapted and reacted to some of the challenges with, with ed tech, building digital strategies, and also looking at what the future potential opportunities are. But then I kind of rec recognized that that's half my life. My other half of my life has been as an ed tech vendor, creating technology. And actually plenty of people, teachers contact me and say, look, I've got a great idea. How do I turn it into a product? So I wanted to share a bit of that experience. Um, but actually conversely, I also recognize that for many schools, when it comes to big investments in new technology, it's actually really helpful to understand the mindset of a vendor, how a product is developed and the considerations and questions that as an educator or as a school leader, um, you should be asking that vendor. And, and many, you know, an IT manager will be familiar with asking about, you know, where is the data stored and what is it compatible with and what's your roadmap and all those kind of questions. So I figured if I could present it in a, an, an accessible and easy to use way, it would be a case of, look, here's one book that gives you the ed tech narrative from different perspectives, but hopefully something you can dip into. And at the end of it, rather than EdTech being the realm of a particular subset, we'll think of it in just the same way as we do, you know, a minor point, like an interactive whiteboard or a book. It's just part of the fabric of a classroom. It's just part of the tech things we use in a school, but we shouldn't really be scared of it or intimidated by it. So the audience is really anyone in education from teachers to admins to... Absolutely. I, mean, I think everyone has a, a, a view. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, I mean, parents, you know, some schools have been really successful in engagement, have been where they've actually made sure that parents are engaged with their child's learning, have confidence in the technology the child is using at home, the systems. It provides extra support for our younger learners, helps when it comes to digital citizenship for our older learners and keeping them safe online. But actually, you know, the most successful technology is the stuff that you don't talk about. It's just part and parcel of doing your job. And I think from that point of view, the way you make technology successful is that you ensure that everybody is confident that it has value to what they're trying to achieve. And so everyone has to be part of the conversation. All right. Well, it is now time for the speed geek questions. I know these are, uh, can be ch the most challenging, but the idea is just quick, uh, short answers. You can expound on them if you like, but uh, we'll, we'll go for three of them here and to be mindful of your time here. All right. So the first one is, are you a gamer and what is your game? Well, I, I feel really bad actually, because the simple answer is no, not anymore. <laughs> but if you'd asked me this question 30 years ago, I would have told you I was quite a fan of sensible soccer, but that's probably <laughs> um, going to be half the audience saying no idea what you're talking about. Al. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right. Question number two is, uh, okay, this is a good one. So what's a tech trend to watch out for? Well, everyone's, I think, or many will be aware of AI in the concept of an education when, it, when we think about how it can help personalize learning. One thing I think is definitely a trend we should keep a lookout for is, is AI when it comes to accessibility. We're all used to the idea that, you know, certainly in the UK, we still take our exams with a pen and paper. And as we get a bit older, we're allowed to use a keyboard. But I actually think the spoken word, the voice, and the adoption of many of the tools that are in our homes now that allow us to speak and engage with information is such that I think um, AI and the spoken word is where the, there will be the most rapid gains in the coming years. All right. And the last one is, uh, what's your first storage device? That would be a uh, C60 audio cassette. <laughs> Storing the programs on my BBC Micro. I would buy a magazine on a Saturday morning. I would spend hours typing the code in and many more hours fixing my typos. And then would have a very simple game. And at the end of it, I would save it onto an audio cassette. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, you and I are, I guess, of the same tech generation because then there's very few few of us, I think, out there. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're getting close to retirement. If you started with your... Uh, with, with a cassette audio tape. <laughs> Let's just keep that to ourselves, all right? <laughs> yes, yes, we will. Well, Al, thank you so much for your time. And uh, really, I I'm amazed at the work you've done in your background and uh, looking forward to digging deeper into your book. So uh, thank you for your time and, and energy and your ex expertise. Oh, it's my pleasure. Lovely to speak with you. Yes. All right. Have a great day.